The following interview was conducted with Lowell Cain and Laura Blackburn for the Purdue University Oral History Project. It took place on March 11, 2013 in the Swaim Instruction Center in Archives and Special Collections. The interviewer's name is Sammy Morris. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. As background information for researchers in the future who may study this interview, would you please state for the record your full name, when you were born, and where? And you can just take turns, whichever. Sure. Uh, my name is Lowell Benjamin Kane. I was born in Great Neck, New York, which is on Long Island, and I was born on October 21st, 1982. Great. My name is Laura, Bla Laura Renee Blackburn. Uh, I was born in Charleston, South Carolina on September 22nd, 1989. Super. And could each of you tell me your parents' names and whether you have any siblings? Sure. I have one brother named Harrison Kane, and my parents are Susan Kane and Jeffrey Kane. I also have one brother. Uh, his name is Matthew Blackburn. Uh, my mother's name is Cheryl Thomas, and my father's name is Terry Blackburn. Great. Thanks to you both so much. Um, maybe now if you could just tell me really briefly about when you were growing up, where you went to school? Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Great Neck, New York, and I attended the Great Neck public school system. My elementary school was Lakeville School. I went to Great Neck South Middle and Great Neck South High School. And for college, I attended the State University of New York at Stony Brook, followed by graduate work at Texas A&M University. Great. How about you, Laura? Okay. Um, I grew up in Frankfort, Indiana, and attended uh, three different elementary schools, um, Southside Elementary, Kiger Elementary, and Suncrest Elementary. Mm -hmm. Uh, I attended uh, Frankfurt Middle School and then spent two years at Frankfurt Senior High School and then transferred to the Indiana Academy for Science, Mathematics, and, Huma Mathematics and Humanities uh, in, um, in Muncie, Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, from there, I did one year of university at the University of San Francisco in San Francisco, California, and I'm currently at Purdue University uh, as an undergraduate in my graduate work uh, will be a, a master's at Purdue University. Great. Well, I think um, one of the things I'm very interested in finding out from each of you is how did you first become an advocate for LGBTQ communities? Hmm. Um, I don't think growing up I ever expected to be in a role like I currently occupy, which is the inaugural director of the LGBTQ Center at Purdue University, um, nor did I think I would be the inaugural coordinator or founding staff member of the center at my previous institution, Texas A&M University. I grew up wanting to be an archeologist like Indiana Jones. Um, <laughs> but I think like many people who grow up in the LGBTQ community, we often become accidental activists, um, meaning that we experience life and marginalization and bullying and silencing and it happens at such a level that first we feel very alone, then we look for community, and in that community we start building this sense of we should be treated fairly, not different, not special, but fairly equal. Um, and really it, be, it became a track that was never intended, um, but something I fell in love with. Mm -hmm. And so starting as first, you know, when I came out to myself, realizing that I was being treated differently than even my straight brother um, and the people that I went to school with. And then as I was in college, realizing that there were equity issues abound, um, recognizing that I could do something that I had a voice and that it was a powerful one. And getting involved at that level has kind of led me down this path first from being a student leader um, to being an institutional member of Creating Change. And just kind of a follow-up, Lowell, what, when was that that you came out and you made that realization about that you were being treated differently? Um, I knew personally that I was different from my peers, from my friend group, um, by the age of 9 or 10. Um, I didn't know necessarily or have the words for what it meant, but I think by about 11 or 12, I did. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that the words were gay. I also knew not to tell anybody. Mm -hmm. Because if you told people you were treated like poorly, you were bullied, you were harassed, you were teased, you were beaten up. 
Um, and I had witnessed that multiple times. This was also at a volatile time. Um, it was the early 1990s in New York, which was in the midst of the start of this pandemic we call AIDS. Um, and at the time, there was still a lot of stereotypes and misinformation linking AIDS explicitly to a gay community, which is certainly not true. Um, but at the time, there was a lot of fear around being gay. And even internally, I had perceptions um, and internalized homophobia mm -hmm. that all gay men die of AIDS by the time they're about 30. So I didn't have many expectations for myself, to be totally honest with you. Um, but I knew I was being treated differently. I knew that it was scary, and I knew not to tell other people. And it wasn't until a few years later that I felt comfortable to tell other people. Okay, thanks so much. Laura? Um, my, uh, my activism and advocacy in the LGBT community really came, uh, became clear to me when uh, I lived in, in San Francisco. Um, it was the 2008, it was the 2008, 2009 school year. And um, the that was the um, election of President uh, President Obama, and it was also the um, the year that California voters voted on Proposition Eight, which is a constitutional amendment to the um, to the Constitution of the State of California, um, defining marriage as between one man and one woman. And being in San Francisco, I never thought that being in San Francisco or being in California, I would ever e experience something like that uh, because I had this I had this vision of San Francisco and California being um, very, very liberal and nothing like the place where like the place where I was from. I mean, even in Indiana to this day, we still don't have a constitutional amendment banning same sex marriage and um, and so that was something that I didn't, that just didn't sit okay with me at the age of 18. And at that time, I still, uh, I wanted to be a lawyer and I wanted to be like a civil rights lawyer. And um, I thought that I could protect myself and other people like me um, by becoming a lawyer. And uh, I had that goal at the age of probably 11 or 12 mm -hmm. Uh, when I realized that I, in fact, was gay. And I always saw my, my friends being treated differently or even people that didn't identify as gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender or anything like that um, being called, you know, terrible names and being beaten up if they showed any sort of um, deviation from an, from an expected um, gender norm mm -hmm. in, in small-town Indiana. And so after volunteering on the, volunteering and being a, an organizer for the No on Eight campaign, which was the campaign against the proposition, um, the proposition passed and I was completely devastated. And I was so, I just felt so unwelcome mm -hmm. in San Francisco and I felt so unwelcome in California. And I thought, you know, if I'm not welcome in California, then where else am I going to be welcome in this country? And so. Um, after that year, I ended up transferring back to Purdue University, and I got involved um, almost immediately with the LGBTQ community here at Purdue. And then um, we started pushing for for policy changes, and and I really found I really found my my passion in uh, working in and on behalf of the LGBT community because it's not it's not just about me it's about the community and how the community is treated and, and like Lola's saying you know it's not about being treated different it's about being treated equal mm -hmm. and um, so that's something that I continue to strive I mean to strive for every day so that's how I became an advocate I would that's say. Great. I mean, it sounds like um, you know not to put words in either of your mouths but you know, you have a person. You have you're affected personally by something, and you want to help things for the broader community mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of your own experiences. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would add that it's something that this has been something I'm very proud of um, in my lifetime to see a lot of change take place. I really never would have guessed that so much change would happen. I'm 30 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I would not have guessed that we would be where we are today when I was that 10 mm -hmm. year old boy. Um, and in addition to that this work has brought so much fulfillment to my life and it's been an amazing experience to be a part of. Yeah, I'm really mm -hmm. grateful there were people like both of you out there. <laughs> um, 
Maybe tell me just a little bit, kind of backing up to um, your college years. So I know, Laura, you're still, it, you're entering a master's program soon, if not mm -hmm. already, correct? Um, Lowell, what about uh, your first job after graduating from college in New York? What, what was that position? Do you remember? Yes. Uh, <laughs> my first job after leaving college was working in a law firm okay. in New York City. It was the law offices of Mitchell Cantor. Um, it was not a pleasant experience mm -hmm. overall because I had no desire to work in the legal world. Um, but it was a well-paying position. And at the same time, I was actually balancing two jobs in order to support myself. Um, New York is a very expensive place to live, um, continues to be so today. And so my other job was working in an art capacity as an art consultant mm -hmm. for the, what was the name of it? Let me think. Um, it was named after the woman who owned the business, Carol Thibault Pomerantz, and she specialized in 18th century <laughs> French decorative arts. Wow, that's so and so, <laughs> yes, it was a very interesting and really particularly the wallpaper of French 18th century <laughs> mansions and homes. And so it was a very interesting kind of dual career that had nothing to do with what my interests were, um, but in many ways they were just a paycheck mm -hmm. um, to help me subsist and really carry me forward into my next step, which was going to graduate school. I had known um, by the time that I was graduating undergraduate, that I would be going to graduate school. Mm -hmm. So this was just to carry me through. Sure. Okay. Well, I know um, prior to coming to Purdue, you worked at Texas A&M. Can you tell us a little bit about the path that led you to A&M and your role there? Sure. Um, as an undergraduate, I focused on two areas. The first area was my academics, and that was in the major of anthropology. Um, I kind of straddled the field between archaeology and cultural anthropology. And then my student activism work, which was leading the LGBTQ student organization, um, which was called at the time LGBTA at State University of New York at Stony Brook again. And it was a very interesting position to be in because at the time there were no institutionalized resources, so it fell on the students to always do the advocacy work. Um, and I loved it. And towards the latter point of my college career, an advisor who I spoke to basically sat me down and said, nobody's ever going to pay you to be gay, but you're a really good academic. You should consider graduate school and focus on that. And in looking at that option, I thought, well, they're probably right. I had no, I had no idea that people worked full time in LGBT work at that point, at that point of my life. And, um, I got in contact with a person who I had been excavating with who was doing her graduate work um, at Arizona State University, Dr. Suzanne Eckert. Um, she was finishing her PhD. She was hired in 2004 as the first female archaeologist on faculty at Texas A&M University. And through her uh, and knowing her and knowing that our research was in alignment, um, I applied to that institution, having done no background research on what the LGBTQ experience might be on that campus. Mm -hmm. um, I would advise people in the future to always look into that. <laughs> um, and applied and was accepted to Texas A&M University to work on a PhD in archaeology. And that's what brought me to the institution. Um, within two years of being there, though, I recognized both that my passion in the LGBTQ side was not being met um, and that there were a lot of challenges, more than I could have ever imagined on that campus. And do you want me to go into that a little bit? Sure, or? yeah. Whatever and it, you're comfortable sure. with. Sure. And um, it was through experiences that I had in just personal relationships with faculty and with other peers on that campus um, that were really unpleasant that I kind of had this talk with myself of, well, you could always leave and go back to New York. Um, the way that I rationalized even attending Texas A&M during my first two years there was I was picturing a 10 year long program for this PhD and I said to myself, if people can go to jail for 10 years, you certainly can stay at Texas A&M. Mm. And that's not a good way to rationalize anything. Mm. Um, and so in having this kind of realization that I could do work to change that campus, I started advocacy work, I got involved 
in what was then called a Women's and Gender Equity Center, but it really didn't do any LGBT work except a few, like I think there were $1,700 in the budget per year to do advocacy work for the LGBTQ community. Um, and got involved there as a graduate assistant and kind of took over that role and started advocating through the administration for more resources. Mm -hmm. And that's what led me down this path of eventually leading or leaving the PhD program and being the inaugural coordinator of a full-time position and a full-time dedicated LGBT center um, that was the first of its kind in the state of Texas mm -hmm. in an institution of higher education. That was um, actually my next question is, what was it like to establish the first GLBT resource mm -hmm. center at a public institution in Texas? Uh, you've talked a little bit about this already, but what was the climate like for LGBTQ people at A&M? Mm -hmm. um, so that was, so there is the LGBTQ or GLBT, we call it alphabet soup sometimes, so mm -hmm. I'll go back and forth mm -hmm. in how I reference institutionally the name in Texas A&M was GLBT Resource Center. Okay. And institutionally at Purdue, we are LGBTQ Center right now. Um, the climate at Texas A&M is, it's always hard to capture the true experiences of underrepresented and marginalized populations, but some of the ways that that's done is through some of the groundbreaking work on campus climate studies by people like Sylvia Hurtado, um, Sue Rankin, there's a number of people who are capturing that at a big picture level. On campus at Texas A&M, few people had done explicit work in regards to what is our campus like. So we had to rely on these broader data sources like the Princeton Review, mm -hmm. which does a kind of a study of how do students perceive their campus. And institutionally, since 1994, when they started asking, is your campus an LGBTQ friendly campus? And it may not be using that same language, mm -hmm over the course of 18, 19 years. Um, but that's the gist of the question. For the entire time that they have asked that question, Texas A&M University has appeared on their listing of the top 20 least LGBT friendly mm -hmm. campuses in the country. And in the time periods in which I was on campus, we fluctuated, but we were always, when it came to the public institutions on that listing, um, we were always in the top three least friendly public institutions in the country, and we were almost always exclusively in the top 10 public or private least friendly LGBT institutions. Wow. And so the perception by students, and perception is important because in many ways perception is a reflection of reality, right? This is my daily life. Um, students themselves perceive the campus as wholly unwelcoming to LGBTQ people, and even potentially, one might say, um, anecdotally dangerous. We knew of places where you could and could not go and what times you should or should not be somewhere, and the threat to physical violence was a reality. Um, and so there were a lot of challenges at that institution that also should be coupled with the fact that there have been LGBT people on that campus probably since it started because LGBT people are everywhere. Um, in all time periods and in all cultures. Um, and there are many allies as well who have been working for a long time, even before there was an LGBT center set up, um, in creating safer spaces on campus, networking opportunities, resources for people. I'm certainly not the first person who was doing that work. Mm -hmm. um, but I was there at this right time and right place when a moment of sea change really took place. Well, just knowing and hearing you talk about the climate and knowing that's what it was like, how do you think the Resource Center ever came into existence? Do you think it was almost a response to this terrible climate that something had to be done? Or were there just a few good allies out there who were trying to get some change started, do you think? It would be nice if I could tell mm -hmm. a story that said institutionally there was a recognition that LGBT people were being treated unfairly and marginalized and administration said we need to change this mm -hmm. and create a safer space. And I wish that could be the story in most campuses. Mm -hmm. And that's in most campuses not the story and it was not the story at Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. um, essentially the background history that is documented in the university archives um, at Texas A&M University 
is that in the year, academic year of 2006 to 2007, when I started working as a programming graduate assistant in the Women's and Gender Equity Resource Center, in December of 2006, the director of that center resigned because there were so many issues that she was experiencing of resistance and obstacles being put in her way by administration as well as the campus community. Um, Brenda Bethman, she resigned. Within three weeks from that resignation, the only other full-time staff member, Sarah Benderitis, who was the program coordinator, also tendered her resignation wow. because of the same type of hostility and issues that she was experiencing. And so there were no full-time staff members any longer. There were three graduate assistants, and there were a couple of student workers, undergraduate student workers. And at first, we weren't sure what the future was going to be. Um, we were assigned a saving grace in many ways, Dr. Linda Parrish, a retired faculty member, um, as an interim director who came in for half a day on Tuesdays. Wow. And even though she was only there a limited amount of time, her support and her advocacy really is a reason why we exist um, or why those resources still persist on campus um, because she recognized that they were needed. She recognized that we were doing hard work as students to keep this place afloat, mm -hmm. and she went to bat for us. Now, in the months after the resignation of Brenda Bethman and Sarah Benderitis, things were very shaky. And at A&M, there's a history of making sweeping social changes when students and faculty are gone, mm -hmm. and they come back to these huge changes. And that usually happens in winter break and summer. And so summer rolled around. We were not sure what the future was going to be for any resources for women or LGBT people. Um, and early in summer, we received an email from the then interim vice provost or provost for the institution, Dr. Jerry Strasser, that was to us as the student workers that said, on August 28th, I believe, um, please make sure you lock the resource center and make sure that it's emptied of your personal effects and tender the key to the Department of Science, which was the proctor for that floor of the Blocker building. Um, Blocker 513 was where the WGERC, the Women's and Gender Equity Resource Center, was located. And to us, that was the death knell, right? It was the, you are going to be closed, take your personal things and go and do not return. Um, and at that moment, we basically took that information um, and we sent it out to the media as students because with the freedom of speech that we had, the protections that students have on college campuses, we felt safe enough to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we released information to the media saying that A&M was working to close the only resources for women, for LGBT people. Um, it was the only lactation room on campus mm -hmm. where there was a fridge dedicated to providing breast milk um, or storage of breast milk on campus. It was the only LGBT library and film collection. And we sent that out to the media locally and also at the national level. Um, and we made calls to friends at the Human Rights Campaign, the HRC, who made calls to campus asking questions of these high administrators and raising the alert that there was going to be a protest. Mm -hmm. We used social media to create a page that was called Stop the Closing of the WGE. And in the matter of two or three days, more than 1,800 people liked the page. And we printed that out and we sent that information to the administration as well and said there's going to be a very unpleasant situation of brewing on this campus. Um, and we heard nothing for a couple of days. And so in the interim of hearing nothing, we prepared as if we were going to close. Linda Parrish, Dr. Parrish gave us the authority to use as much money in the budget as possible to buy resources. Mm -hmm that were LGBT and women's resources because at the very least they would be absorbed into the library system. And so we spent thousands of dollars mm -hmm. on books and media. Um, and then we reserved like $1,500 or something in that neighborhood for a closing party, which Linda strategically invited all of her faculty contacts, all of her administrative contacts, and everybody who she knew she personally invited to the closing of the WGERC. -E so much so that we even had a cake, a two-sheet cake made with the symbol of the WGE and the thank you for being a part of the WGERC. Um, and we were throwing this party 
on the very last day, and I want to say it was August 27th, 28th, something in that neighborhood. Um, and on the morning that we were setting up the party, my cell phone rang, my personal cell phone, saying, this is the vice president for student affairs office. Would you please report to the coldest building? And I had no idea what that was or who that was. And I thought I was getting kicked out of school because I had sent all that information to the media. And I walked into a conference room with a long table and three people who I had never seen, Dr. David Parrott, um, Myrna Jacobson, who's now Dr. Myrna Jacobson, and Dr. Carol Binzer. And Dr. Parrott, in his capacity as the dean of students slash an associate vice president of student affairs, informed me that they were going to separate out resources and divide them somewhat equitably, which was not the case, um, where a women's resource center, standalone women's resource center, would open in the vice president of student affairs umbrella or the division of student affairs, um, and Myrna Jacobson would serve in its capacity as director. Mm -hmm. And that a LGBT or GLBT resource center would open in the offices of the dean of student life under the division of student affairs where Carol Binzer, Dr. Binzer, who was then working as the director of student life, would oversee this center, whatever it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And they offered me the opportunity to run this new center that would be dedicated to the LGBTQ community. But there was a caveat attached. Mm -hmm. And the caveat was that they would not call it a lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, or queer center. Mm -hmm. For the first year at least, it would be a softly funded program area and that it would be called the Gender Issues Education Center, G-I-E-C. And while that was m rather offensive um, in terminology and in like hiding what this resource would be, um, it was still a major step and we needed to celebrate that and we needed to use it as a platform to advocate for more. And so it was literally in that moment that I made the decision to leave my PhD program entirely and even leave my pursuit of a graduate degree at least momentarily um, in order to devote myself full-time to founding the center and building it into something new and big and important. And we did operate for the first year as the Gender Issues Education Center. We were housed in a very small and cramped and uncomfortable um, space that could only accommodate a handful of people at a time, mm -hmm. but it was a start. And it was a start to something that grew and grew and grew. And in five years that I was there, until 2012, um, we moved offices five times to com continue to um, create enough space for the people who used that resource. That's incredible. Wow, mm -hmm. what an amazing journey. Um, I realize this may be a little awkward, but I'm thinking this might be a good way to seg time to segue into how the Purdue Center got started. Mm -hmm. And I know that both of you have things that you'd like to say about that. I know um, prior to you coming, Lowell, that Laura, you were involved in this as well as the hiring for his position. So mm -hmm. maybe you could give us a little background on, I guess, when you first became involved in gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender issues at Purdue. Okay. Um, and two, I guess I'll have to, to go back to the year before I came to Purdue, which is 2008. Um, the, uh, at the time, the Queer Student Union, which is now the LGBTQ Student Alliance, it's the overall umbrella um, group for LGBTQ people, little students on campus. And um, they published this thing called the White Paper, and in it they laid out um, basically... A bunch of a bunch of goals for the LGBTQ community at the time. Uh, there was a uh, there's a designated student space that had to be, that has to be reapplied for every year. Um, so there's always the the concern that you know you we wouldn't get the space again. And we also wanted to have uh, we wanted to have a, a, a dedicated staff person, mm -hmm. and we wanted to have a center, and we wanted to have resources. And so that, that white paper, as it's known, was published in 2008 as part of uh, a list of suggestions for the university's five-year strategic plan from 2008 to 2013. And on that, we had uh, establishing, 
on that list they, they wrote that we wanted to have a full-time staff person, uh, we wanted to have a dedicated university funded um, center, um, and we wanted to have a more inclusive non-discrimination policy and um, a few other uh, a few other things that were in that report were a lot of uh, a lot of numbers and data from some of the reports that Lowell had just talked mm -hmm. about from like the Princeton Review and all these other things. And so when I got involved with the Queer Student Union, I became the political activist chair. And in my capacity as a political activist chair, I assisted with the first step, <laughs> and we decided to to push for an inclusive non-discrimination statement. And at that time, uh, the university's non-discrimination statement covered sexual orientation, but it did not cover gender identity, gender expression, uh, genetic material, uh, veteran status, and a few other things. And we, we really wanted to update that because we thought, you know, if we're going to go into this, if we're going to if we're going to dedicate ourselves to really changing this campus, we need a non-discrimination policy first, so that if something goes wrong, at least we have something to fall back mm -hmm. on and we have some sort of kind of claim with the university. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's what we did. Uh, in 2008 they started that campaign and I came in in 2009 and at that time uh, the Board of Trustees at Purdue had denied hearing an expansion of the non-discrimination statement. And so we decided to go through Purdue Student Government and there's a process through Purdue Student Government um, that if it if something is channeled the proper ways it can be um, heard and voted upon by the Board of Trustees. And so that's the route we decided to take. And we had the um, CORE Senator, her name was Jessica Rombach, and CORE stands for Council, of, Council on uh, Respect and Equality. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a group of um, underrepresented and minority students at Purdue University that, tries, that operates through a social justice model to try to make campus a more inclusive space for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so she introduced a change to the non-discrimination statement, and we, and so we began the, the the semester long push to kind of shuffle that through the Purdue Student Government Senate, and once it passed the Senate, the um, the Purdue Student Government President at the time, who's Brad Kreitz, uh, brought it before the Board of Trustees. It was <coughs> it was passed in uh, uh, I believe it was December seventeenth, which was winter break. Purdue also follows the whole let's make big social changes that affect students and faculty when they're not here. Um, so it was passed uh, at the Board of Trustees meeting uh, in December of 2010. And then from there we said okay, you know, we've got this on discrimination statement and at the time the LGBTQ advisory board uh, was, was forming and really getting funding and really pushing forward. And the LGBTQ Advisory Board answers to uh, Dr. Christine Taylor, mm -hmm. who's the Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion. And she was, a, she is, continues to this day, to be a, a humongous, amazing, amazing advocate um, for, for students, I mean, just in general. And through the, through the Advisory Board uh, and the student group of the QSU, we started pushing for these other things. And every year we brought up, you know, we need a director, we need a director. I mean, not even, not even saying a center, because we were trying to do it piecemeal and trying mm -hmm. to really just pick, like, do focus on one thing at a time. Because we figured, you know, they, they know already what we're doing because it's in the white paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you want to know what we're doing, this is what we're doing, but we're doing it one at a time. Mm -hmm. And so there's also a, hu there's also a huge change, um, a huge changeover uh, with student leadership and so focusing on one thing at a time was also easier organizationally um, and it really took a dedication of people just kind of hanging around you know like me and you know Nicholas Goldsmith and, and Brian Lewis who were the president and vice president of the QSU at the time and in 2000 and in 2011 uh, we found out that we were going to go through a a director hiring process and the university had conducted a few different search committees before and they always fell through at the last minute mm -hmm. um, we it got so far as to looking at resumes and then n wanting to invite people to campus and then magically there was no money oh we don't have money to bring 
we don't have money to bring people to campus, but we encourage you know, but you know, we encourage you to stay involved and you know to stay vigilant. And you know, maybe someday if we have the money, we'll bring someone to campus. It was it was not outwardly, um, it was not outwardly homophobic, but it was very subtle, and it was always very um, it was very clear and very subtle. And so when we found out when I found out in two thousand and eleven that we were going to have this director search, and I was skeptical. I was really skeptical. Um, I was invited to participate in the search committee, and myself and, and Nicholas Goldsmith uh, were the two were two of the students, two of the undergraduate students on this committee. And you know, we we started the process. We used a hiring, like a like a hiring firm, headhunting firm. I don't know exactly what they were called, but we used Spelman and Johnson to kind of do a lot of that legwork for us of kind of, you know, buying out the candidates and stuff like that. And when we, we, when we brought it down to, okay, these are our three people that we want to bring to campus, um, those people were actually brought to campus. And they were brought to campus and they were, you know, they were given the, you know, the full treatment of having, you know, having multiple meetings over a span of two days and really, you know, given the Purdue experience and everybody on the committee had the chance had the chance and the time to spend with them and then um, after that process we we made uh, we made comments and um, a few of us uh, made recommendations personally to Dr. Taylor we didn't as a committee mm -hmm. uh, the committee's job was to simply gather information about the candidates and to um, spend time with them and to have have them interact with students and see Okay, what's going to be the best fit? What's going to be the best thing for students? And that that vision really came from Dr. Taylor. Mm -hmm. And so my part uh, in that was to, you know, to attend the talks and things like that through their through their process. And at the end of it, like I said, we made a couple a couple suggestions, pros and cons of each candidate, and then um, and then we waited. <laughs> we, we we waited a while. Um, I forget exa exactly how long it was. Well, how long? My was interview it? was April seventeenth, and my hire was the end of June. Yeah, so it was a while. So we were very nervous of like, oh my gosh, so the school year ended, and I was just just so wrapped up in what, like, when is this going to happen? Like, yeah. we, did we did we spend all of these tens of thousands of dollars this time just to have this be like a failed search or a failed process? And these are you know, these are living, breathing people who are absolutely amazing that we brought to campus. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're just not going to respond to them. But when, um, when I found out that, that Lowell had been, had been selected, I was very excited um, for all of the reasons <laughs> that, um, that, you, that we've heard so far in, in his story about his, his advocacy and his passion and his dedication. Um, and start, you know, and having the experience of starting a center and operating in a very, very conservative and I would, I would say, hostile environment, mm -hmm. and still being able to be successful, and um, for me, that was just, I mean, that 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 was yeah, that was perfect, and I think that uh, I think that we're very, <laughs> very lucky to have him, mm -hmm. and so when when he was hired, we were very excited and thinking, oh my gosh, where's his office going to be? Mm -hmm. You know, where, where, where is he going? Yeah. And um, I sat down with uh, Dr. Taylor, and she said, "What, like, what is your vision? What is your, like, what, what do you think should happen here?" And I said, "Well, you know, Dr. Taylor, to be honest, I just hope he has a window. Yeah. You know, I, I just hope he has a window, <laughs> and I hope there's enough room for a desk and people, and you know." And she could see right through that and said, "No, what, what's your vision? Mm -hmm. What's your like? What's your goal? If you could have everything that you wanted right now, and money wasn't an issue, and you know personnel wasn't the issue, what do you see?" And I said, "Well, you know, our the goal is to have a center with with dedicated staff people other than other than the director because yeah. the directors are great, but you also need." You know that director is going to need an assistant, and eventually they're going to need you know program coordinators, and they're going to need student staff and graduate mm -hmm. assistants, and all of these things to really build, you know, build build a center. And so, um, so after that meeting, I found out that um, that Lowell was in fact going to have an office, 
and the chairperson of the LGBTQ Advisory Board, who's also on the search committee for Lowell's position, uh, Sarah Carvel. She's a counselor currently in the Dean of Students office. Um, said, hey, uh, why don't you come over for lunch? And I'm gonna go show you, I'm gonna go show you um, Lowell's office. I'm like, okay. And so I go over and I meet up with Sarah and um, Dr. Taylor's assistant then uh, was Shanna Brenninger. Brenninger, yeah. Brenninger. Um, and so Shanna met up with, um, with Sarah and I and we walked over to the engineering administration building. <laughs> and, I th and I walked in and I thought, oh no, like is he going to be in an oversized closet? Uh -huh. You know, that was my concern. And so we hopped in the elevator and we went up to the third floor and we walked into ENAD 301. And I just started, I, was, I just started misting up. I was just so overwhelmed because in that space, there's a, there's a single-use restroom, which is, you know, which is gender neutral. There's an office space for an assistant. There's like a, commun like a communal space, um, a large open space. And then there's a, you know, a fairly large office with you know, four or five windows, not just one window. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just so completely overwhelmed. And it kind of even like, makes me kind of choke up about it because um, it's not something that, that we thought would happen <laughs> anytime soon. You know, yeah. we were just, uh, I was just very glad that we had a person, wherever that person would end up. And, um, and it hadn't been renovated yet, so it still looked like a lab. Mm -hmm. But um, after it was renovated and then seeing Lowell in that space for the first time was, um, was really amazing. And it, f it, was, it was very rewarding. And it just, um, the whole process that took years really just, make you know makes me passionate about this work and uh, and just being very grateful to be to be part of to be part of that process and um i'm just i'm just glad that lowell is now here and that we have a center and we have um institutional resources and institutional support and mm -hmm. and that it doesn't all fall on the the responsibility of students who are taking you know who are taking classes and are supposed to be students and not yeah. Um, not doing the kinds of training and the kind of programming that Lowell does. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a, that, that was the process from, from my perspective. That's terrific. It's a really great summary. And probably at some point I'll beg you to do another interview where I can talk more in depth about, you know, what it was like trying to get some of these policies and so forth through these various groups and the Board of Trustees mm -hmm. and how they responded to that. But mm -hmm. for today, um, I want to make good use of both of your time. So um, I will just segue into asking each of you, what are your goals at this moment for the center and where you'd like to see it go maybe in the next one to three years? Do you mm -hmm. want to start? I can start if you. Yeah, okay? Well, I, wanted, I think a student perspective is so important. And mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, where I would love to see the center go in the next one to three years is um, over into a bigger space because we've already outgrown it. Um, uh, there's a, Lowell has an assistant and she has her office. And uh, there's, a, there's currently a TV and, a, and lib you know, there's a library of books and resources and films. And um, there is seating, but there are so many people in there sometimes that you don't have anywhere to sit. <laughs> It's a good problem. And so mm -hmm. it's a it's a, it's a very exciting problem to have because it just it's just you know this means you know hey we need a bigger space and you know we need we need more people to do more programming and things like that and so um, I would hope for eventually um, a bigger space mm -hmm. uh, program wise I would love to see the current um, the current safe zone training just continue to expand. And um, from my perspective, it's been a while, you know, it's been a wildly successful. Um, I would love to see, you know, just more and more and more people go through, you know, safe zone training and become allies to the community. Uh, and, and it really just a continuation of um, the Distinguished Lecture Speaker Series that's been going on. And um, I, I, I've, just, I've just been so impressed and so enthralled over over this past year of just the types of programming and the types of ideas mm -hmm. that Lowell has had, that Lowell has had and then put into action through the center. And so I'm really just, you know, excited to see it expand and grow. And um, it'll be interesting to see what, 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 what he will have come up with three years from now. Yeah. 
I, I echo a lot of the structural and personnel and programmatic um, areas for growth. Um, certainly, as the center continues to expand, the need for more space, the need for more staff is going to become critical if it isn't critical already, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. The need for more allocated funds for these programs to take place as well, um, because it is the university, a university is an expensive environment to work through. Mm -hmm. And so being able to do the programs requires funding. Um, and so as we develop the structural, the programmatic areas, that's all critical to me. But where I envision another area of growth is also in opportunities for collaboration and partnership. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've been very pleasantly welcomed and surprised by how welcoming Purdue and many aspects and areas on Purdue's campus has been, but there are still areas that we have not had any access in. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily that there are roadblocks or gatekeepers. There might be, there sometimes are. Um, but a lot of it is that, you know, there are spaces that are historically perceived of as a little bit less open. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to navigate and enter some of those spaces and engage in what might be sometimes difficult conversations. Um, examples of spaces um, would be like the ROTC, mm -hmm. so anything related to mm -hmm. military, um, but also academic areas uh, that people may not often assume to be LGBT friendly. Um, and so again, that idea of perception is a reflection of reality sometimes. Mm -hmm. So majors like engineering mm -hmm. and a lot of the STEM fields are often perceived of as spaces where LGBTQ people um, are not welcomed and not openly affirmed. Um, and so being able to gain access into spaces like that, creating inclusive classroom environments, I'm very privileged in that I get to work all day in very safe spaces, right? Because wherever I am essentially is the safe space mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways for a lot of people. And in, a, in an LGBTQ center, the odds of me experiencing something overtly homophobic, biphobic, or transphobic are pretty, pretty low. Mm -hmm. Not impossible, but pretty low. Um, but that said, my students don't go to school or class or live in an LGBTQ center or even in safe spaces. They operate in what I often refer to as brave spaces, mm -hmm. spaces where this marketplace of ideas that a university is supposed to be um, can create an opportunity for ideas, beliefs, and values to sometimes collide, sometimes create conflict, um, sometimes complement each other. And so creating opportunities for faculty to learn and to provide mechanisms to ensure safer classrooms or safer residence halls, expanding the safe zone program is a huge part of that vision um, so that faculty and staff know that this resource exists. We have been very successful. If you just talk in metrics alone, um, in this first semester of having a dedicated safe zone training that is consistent on campus, um, which hasn't really existed before, in this one semester, really in the span of three and a half months, we have trained more than 300 people and more than 250 of those trained people signed a contract that they decided and chose to sign saying that they will operate as a safe zone. Somebody who's a friend, a supporter, a listening ear, and who knows resources mm -hmm. and is willing to put up a sign, a placard, that says that they are this person mm -hmm. um, on their office, their residence hall door, even on their cart. If they, We have custodians who put this on their cart. Mm -hmm. um, this is an amazing achievement. And 250 people to sign that contract at my previous institution would have been between a year and a half to two years worth of trainings. And that is something that has blown me away. Um, but giving people language to use on syllabi so that they can create what we call a diversity welcome statement um, that includes language about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression um, is an area that I'm really pushing mm -hmm. these days. I would really like to see classroom environments be seen as a safer environment because we know that when students feel safe, even if they just feel marginally safer because there is this statement at the beginning of the academic year, their ability to persist and succeed goes up. Mm -hmm. We know that there's a correlation that exists. 
And so creating those safer spaces, those academic safer spaces, or those residential safer mm -hmm. spaces is an area that I'm really pressing on this campus. That's really mm -hmm. exciting. I know when I see the safe zone signs or cards, um, you do, you're right, it, there's an immediate uh, response, mm -hmm. even if it's not always conscious of just right. feeling more at ease right. in someone's space, knowing they're a welcoming type person. And we always make the effort to say that just because somebody doesn't have a safe zone placard does not mean that they are operating in a hostile way towards the community. But this is a community that often needs to see an overt statement of mm -hmm. you are welcome and safe here. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. Um, so I think we'll, we'll segue down a little bit more to um, maybe following up on the things Laura was saying in terms of you coming on campus to mm -hmm. interview. Can you tell me a little bit about what the interview process was like for you yeah. and how much student <laughs> input was involved versus administrators and stuff? Sure. Um, it's a very interesting story in that when this position came on the market, first I will acknowledge that I'm very thankful that I had seven years on Texas A&M's campus, five of which were running the GLBT Resource Center, because I feel like that was an amazing training experience for me. Um, transitioning out of being an academic archaeologist and learning the lingo and the processes of student affairs work. Um, I quickly transitioned in my second year of being a full-time staff member into a recognition that I didn't know a whole lot of things about the work that I was supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I sought out a master's program focusing on multicultural and diversity education because that was really what this role in many ways encompasses. Um, creating those safer spaces, engaging in those difficult dialogues, et cetera, et cetera. And so the opportunity to learn both in the academic sense and also through the experiential side of it by being in student affairs and being enveloped in this world was an amazing, amazing procedure for me. Um, that said, there's not many of us mm -hmm. that do this work full time and professionally. In 2012, when this position came on the market, um, fewer than 7% of higher education institutions in the country had full-time staff members. Wow. There's about 150 um, full-time staff members in the whole country. Most of us know each other. <laughs> um, so, you know, when an announcement goes out, it goes out through our major organization, which is called the Consortium of LGBT Resource Professionals in Higher Education. We have a listserv that posts postings like this. Um, whenever they open up. Because whenever a center is opening in a new school, mm -hmm. that is a big deal and a huge cause for celebration. Um, within this network of 150 people, there are even fewer of us who have been the founding or the inaugural staff member. Mm -hmm. um, so it really does catch our attention when something like this milestone happens in higher ed. The strategic plan that Laura mentioned also cited the fact that Purdue was the only institution at the time mm -hmm. in the Big Ten that did not have this mm -hmm. resource. Mm -hmm. And so it really showed an area for growth that was missing, lacking. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm appreciative of the fact that Purdue did acknowledge that this is an area they need to expand into. Um, that said, when the announcement came out in probably January of 2012, um, I was not job searching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so this posting came out over the consortium's listserv, and as I usually did, I looked at it, I was like, oh good, Purdue is doing something, and then I deleted it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think about it again. <laughs> um, but what started happening was really fascinating. Colleagues of mine from Texas A&M and from other institutions started forwarding me this announcement saying, FYI, hey, did you see? hey, Purdue's a lot like Texas A&M. It's another land-grant institution. Mm -hmm. It's another conservative campus. It's another STEM campus. It's another big school, more than 30,000 people, students. Um, you should consider this. And I thought to myself, ah, well, you know, let me look at Purdue. I hadn't really thought much about Purdue in all honesty. And I started looking at the campus, and I thought, this is a really nice community. This is a really cool campus. And I started doing what I do, which is I'm a big LinkedIn person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love the idea of having this professional form of social media. And I actually did a search for Purdue and LGBT. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And what came up was Laura Blackburn <laughs> and Sarah Carvel. Mm. And so I friended or connected with both Laura and Sarah, a student and a professional staff member. Now, the interesting thing that happened next was that I looked at both of their profiles, but we didn't send any messages to each other. And a couple of days after I friended them, my phone in my office, it's late in the afternoon, like four in the afternoon, um, my phone in my office in the GLBT Resource Center at AM rang, and on the other end of the phone was a former colleague of mine who had worked in the Division of Student Affairs, Office of the Dean of Student Life, named Jeff Stefancic, who had left Texas A&M two years before to come and be an associate dean at Purdue University. Mm-hmm. And before we even started the conversation, he announced himself and then said, I also have my colleague Sarah Carvel on the phone. And Sarah is a member of a search committee for a new LGBT position. And I said, oh, great, nice to speak to you both. Um, I told him I was not job searching, that I was just kind of doing my homework and looking into this position. And they kind of, particularly Jeff, went into what I call the hard sell of Purdue. Um, Oh, what an amazing campus this has been, and I really love my transition, (laughs) and you'd be amazed I could pick you up from Texas A&M and blindfold you and drop you in the middle of campus, and the only way that you would be able to tell the difference between the two campuses is that Purdue is prettier. (laughs) And I was like chuckling a little bit because it was so funny to like have this hard sell, but also really nice, again, because you have yet another colleague who's saying to you, you've done good work in one place, can you transfer that experience and even do it better because now you have five years under your belt. And, um, and I valued Jeff and Jeff's opinion. I valued my colleagues' opinions and really started thinking about this. But I still ended that conversation by saying, well, you know, I appreciate your call. I'm not necessarily looking at this time. Um, and they cut me off by saying, are you going to NASPA, the National Association <laughs> of Student Affairs Professionals Conference? And I said, yep. yes, yes, I am. <laughs> And they said, please, if you would, while you're there, get in touch with Julie Tals, who is the chair of the search committee, and let her take you to breakfast or lunch or something like that, and just if you have the time to do that. (laughs) Thanks, all right, we'll do that. I'm like, the hard sell, it was like buying a car, right? It was like a used car salesman for a moment, but it was also, again, like it got my wheels turning. And so I go to NASPA early the next month, early in February, and um. Sure enough, it was impossible for me and Julie to meet each other. Our schedules kept colliding. We couldn't do this. We couldn't do that. The only time that seemed to work for us was like the second or last day, second to the last day or the last day of this big conference. Um, And we would have to meet at like 7.30 in the morning or something like that for breakfast. And we did. And we met for breakfast. And what was amazing to me was that we just hit it off. Um, And she was so authentic and so genuine and told me about her experience Um, being on this campus. She told me about her family. She told me about everything, really. Everything that I had questions about, she had an answer for. And not only did she have an answer for it, but I could see that she genuinely loved Purdue. And that really was encouraging to me. And it was such a good experience, that breakfast, that we ended up staying together and going to the next session. And we talked a little bit through the next session, and then I think almost two sessions, actually. Um, because we saw the keynote together. And so when I left, I had made the decision after meeting with Julie that I would at the very least put application materials in. Mm-hmm. But as Laura mentioned, this process was done not through usual processes that I had been a part of. Mm-hmm. Um, it instead was through the Spellman Johnson Group, which actually was an even more clear indicator to me that Purdue was serious. Mm -hmm. You don't contract SJG unless you're willing to spend big dollars Mm -hmm. on your search. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I submitted my materials to SJG, and one of the things that I realized it said was that you needed also not just letters of recommendation, but essentially nomination letters Uh from other people. Uh And so I asked like two of my colleagues that I was close with um, to send in a nomination letter. I have since learned that many more actually had already nominated me. And that was, again, another heartwarming, like, recognition that people saw that my work was good, and they saw it and acknowledged it in some way. Um, It was a very lengthy, (laughs) very lengthy um, interview process that required more 
letters of recommendation and phone calls than I had ever experienced because the other campuses that were interviewing me at the same time included places like Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a much more rigorous uh, search process to go through Purdue. And I liked that. Yet again, you know, it was just as, again, clear indicator of institutional support to this role. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time I came to the on-campus interview, Purdue was my number one choice. Purdue was definitely, I thought, if I'm going to leave Texas A&M, the only place I'd really be safe and comfortable and happy would be a place like Purdue. And coming to the on-campus, again, sealed that deal. Um, I thought the campus was gorgeous. <laughs> it is gorgeous. Um, and that meant a lot. The community yeah. was really nice. The amount of people who were involved in the search, and not just institutional staff, but the number of students who had a voice at the table um, was wonderful, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And coming to campus for the two and a half, three days that I was here, the ability to make a public presentation to a group of like 60, 70 people um, from all walks of life on the institution, and then also meeting with so many campus partners in these little kind of groups of 10, groups of 20, um, let me know that there was going to be the potential for a broad reach mm -hmm. within this role. And the perceptive, or the perception that I had that differ, differentiated Purdue from other campuses that I was speaking to at the time was that the other campuses that I interviewed at, some of the, put, there was pushback to the interview process mm -hmm. of what could you possibly tell us that we don't already know? Whereas <laughs> Purdue, at all levels, Everybody was saying to me, we can't wait for this position to be filled so that we can do better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is the kind of campus I want to work at. Mm -hmm. um, I had the opportunity to attend a meeting of the LGBTQ Student Alliance while I was here. Mm -hmm. um, and I, as a student development person, was just so excited to see the level of awareness, the level of kind of activism and involvement that these students had. They were the driving force mm -hmm. for so much of this change. And you know, as I mentioned before, it's usually not administration, top level people who have this epiphany mm -hmm. of let's make campus better. Change is driven from the student side. And that's what was happening in this moment and being a part of that moment and empowering students and working with them to help them navigate the university successfully is what I love about this work. And it was in attending that meeting and hearing what they talk about. And really, I just listened a lot in that meeting. I didn't speak a lot. I wanted to hear where their issues were, um, what they were focusing on, and how they're achieving it. Um, and when I left Purdue, Again, I interviewed April 17th. I was just really excited. I was like fired up, actually. It was hard um, not talking about it when I went back to Texas, and especially not talking about it for the next two months that there was this dragged out process. Sorry. And the process wasn't just dragged out. There were issues that caused it to be dragged out, health mm -hmm. issues from people involved, family issues from people involved. But not knowing that, it's, it's rough. Um, the representative from SJG was a woman named Jen Hyatt, and she was fabulous during this process. Mm -hmm. And she kept in touch with me all along the way, just saying, here's an update. I wish I could tell you more. Here's another update. Here's why it's taking so long. And so even through the lengthy process, I still felt connected and informed enough that, you know, if it worked out, fabulous. And if it didn't work out, I still had a great experience that I could talk about. And I could say, wow, there are great things happening at Purdue. That's awesome. um, mm -hmm. And when the offer finally came from Dr. Christine Taylor, I was just enthralled. I was so excited because I had met with Dr. Taylor twice during my interview. And she was the kind of supervisor, the kind of provost that I wanted to be associated with, who pushes for change and who doesn't back down. Um, she is really an amazing force, and Purdue is very fortunate to have administrators like that because there aren't a lot of administrators like that. Mm -hmm. And so being able to work under and learn from her is, for me, a developmental opportunity as well. That's 
Okay, this is Sammy Morris again with Lowell Kane and Laura Blackburn, and we are continuing our interview on March 3rd, 2013. Um, Lowell, you were just talking about your first impressions with Purdue and being offered the position, and I wondered if you could segue into some of the things you're doing now with the center. Sure. Um, we essentially hit the ground running because my start date, the offer came <laughs> in late June with the request that the start date be the second week of July. And so it was a very quick turnaround, um, which also included like my need to leave my position, sell my apartment in Texas, pack my house up, move up here, find a place to live, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in like a couple of week time period. And um, so it was very much a hit the ground running and we're just going to get done what we can get done this first year. And I think this first year actually has been much more of an achievement than I was even expecting it could possibly be. Um, with the first opening of the space itself, Laura mentioned that the space you know, has a common room, it has an office for my assistant, Makiba Washington, it has an office for myself, and then it has this gender neutral bathroom. Mm -hmm. And so that in and of itself, walking into a space like that, I never could have expected um, such an amazing startup location. And I know that it's a humble location to start in because we're gonna grow here in, in fabulous ways. Um, only about 20 centers in the country have an in-house gender neutral bathroom. So again, we're, we're setting us up as one of these leader centers rather than a center that's trying to catch up all the time. Um, we're gonna lead the pack and I have no doubt about that. And in our first year, in our first semester of, of being on campus, some of the initiatives that we've taken up have been first the Distinguished Lecture Series. Mm -hmm. And what this Distinguished Lecture Series is designed to do is to use people's autobiography, the power of telling story, um, to impact our community and to create connections in ways that people may not know they are connected to an LGBTQ community. Um, our speakers in this first year have been some really significant um, individuals. Mm -hmm. The first speaker we brought was Dr. Bernadette Barton, who is a professor at Moorhead State University in Kentucky and the author of a wonderful book called Pray the Gay Away, The Extraordinary Lives of Gays in the Bible Belt. Mm -hmm. um, and she spoke about that kind of intersection of religion and sexuality and how that impacts people's lives. And that's a big topic mm -hmm. in Indiana, as much as it is in the Bible Belt. I often hear Indiana spoken of as the thumb of the South, the <laughs> thumb of the Bible Belt. And so that's a topic that's really critical to discuss here. We brought in Cleve Jones. Mm -hmm. um, Cleve Jones has not only been a longtime activist in this community, but he's also the founder of the AIDS Memorial Quilt. And this year, when he came in 2012, was the 25th anniversary mm -hmm. of the creation of the AIDS Memorial Quilt, which is the world's largest community arts project and the world's largest memorial. Mm -hmm. um, we had sections of the AIDS Memorial Quilt that were unique to Purdue students, faculty, staff, community members who have died. Um, they were on display here in the Purdue Union. And it just so happens that Cleve Jones was born in West Lafayette, Indiana. Wow. And so it was a native son returning home um, and showing that somebody from this community who has created a global impact, mm -hmm. a lasting change in society is an amazing experience to be able to do. Um, we recently hosted Staff Sergeant Eric Alva, who's a retired Marine um, and he was the first American soldier injured in the war in Iraq. Mm. Um, he survived his injury, and when he did so, he came out of the closet as a gay man and was one of the leading voices in the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, mm -hmm. which was the policy, the legal policy that discriminated against gays serving openly in the military. Mm -hmm. um, our next speaker is Zoe Nicholson, who is coming here in two weeks' time on March 21st and 22nd of 2013. Zoe is a bisexual feminist, author, and activist who has been a part of the Equal Rights Amendment movement since the 1960s. Um, and she's spoken out and marched for four decades, um, speaking about her identity as a bisexual woman. Um, and then following her shortly after, we're bringing Professor David Schneer, um, who's an expert uh, on the Nazi persecution mm -hmm. of gays and lesbians during the Holocaust. And so telling stories, and often stories that people may not know about, is a really big part of why we do a Distinguished Lecture Series. Mm -hmm. um, 
In addition to that, we mentioned the Safe Zone Program, which is the first institutionalized Safe Zone training um, at this institution that's open to faculty, staff, students, and community members who want to be that friend, that supporter, that ally to a community because we simply can't make change on our own. We need allies' voices at the table as well. Um, and we need that, that, that advocacy coming from all sides. Um, goodness. Speaking in classrooms, being a guest lecturer, bringing what we call the LGBTQ and Ally Speakers Bureau, which is a trained cohort of students, faculty, and staff members who utilize their own autobiography and their real experiences here at Purdue to connect with their peers. Um, we just spoke before coming here mm -hmm. for this interview. We were just speaking to a bunch of Res Life staff members in Shreve Hall mm -hmm. and answering questions about what has been our experience, what has been our life. Um, facilitating a space where people can ask questions that they may not get to ask anywhere else, that's been a big part of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, building the resources, so building up that library and film collection media resources in a safe space that people can access it. It is very daunting for a person who is not necessarily out of the closet or just doesn't want to disclose that information mm -hmm. to a complete stranger to go to a general library and check out a book by bringing it up to a counter and that book is about LGBTQ lives. Mm -hmm. We need to create those spaces where people can feel safe to access resources. Um, advancing information about the reporting hate and bias mechanism has been another area. We know that this is a community that not only experiences hate and bias and other forms of aggression on campus, um, but we're also a community that's reluctant to report it. Mm -hmm. And institutionally, we need to know that these incidents are taking place. We need to document them. And if possible, we need to respond to them and hold the institution accountable to this non-discrimination policy that was talked about that includes sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. We're pushing for change in residential housing. Um, mm -hmm. People don't often think about what are the spatial needs of LGBTQ identified students? Um, what are the safety concerns that they might have in their safest space where they live, mm -hmm. right? Um, is it safe to use the restroom? We're trying to advocate for increased availability of gender neutral facilities mm -hmm. on campus. Laura mentioned the hopeful development um, of a learning community that would ideally include some form of gender neutral housing option mm -hmm. um, because we have an increasing number of students at any public institution or private institution um, of students who are coming to us that identify as trans mm -hmm. or gender nonconforming, mm -hmm. gender fluid, gender queer. Mm -hmm. And if we decide that as an institution we house people based on their legal recognized status as male or female, what about these students? Mm -hmm. How do we treat them equitably and in a way that affirms who they are? And the answer is not giving them a single mm -hmm. because that's isolating to students. And that's not why people choose to live on campus. They want to live on campus for that social experience. Um, the other area I can talk a little bit about really quickly is even making sure that Purdue is in fact in alignment with our own non-discrimination policy. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we should be, but we are not. Um, and the example that I'll give on that is in trans healthcare issues, um, providing access to hormones, mm -hmm. to potential surgeries um, that trans identified students require right? Mm -hmm. um, so we have this non-discrimination policy, but our benefits for student benefits, student health benefits, and even our staff and faculty health benefits, as they sit today, currently, do not provide um, for trans health coverage. Oh, wow. We are very excited, and this is the first public recognition that I'm about to share with you, um, very excited that the Purdue graduate student government which has a very strong voice in the student health care package, mm -hmm. has approved. And the director of PUSH, Dr. Gail Walenga, has also worked with us to advocate for and successfully advocate for mm -hmm. um, trans health coverage for hormone therapies. When we do our open enrollment again in the fall of 2013, the new student health plan will include coverage for all hormones 
Wow. Um, hormone replacement therapies for transitioning students That's a at huge no victory. yes, and mm -hmm. it's at no added cost to anybody. Oh, that's awesome. And so next up, of course, we need that for faculty and staff. Um, right now, in this entire country, only 25 other institutions cover hormone therapies. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so again, we have this opportunity for Purdue to be a change maker and to be a leader, and we will be that. Um, this is a community of makers, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're pushing for. Those are just a few areas that we're working on, and this is just our first year, as I said. I know, mm -hmm. less, than, less than a year, and you've already made such huge strides, and I think there's no doubt that there's a strong vision there between mm -hmm. you and your staff and the students that there's so much potential for, for, like you said, being a leader. So thank you both so much for your mm -hmm. time, and I would like to schedule part two with you. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. As soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you.